Good evening and welcome to uh, the Curiosity Drives Progress Public Lecture Series for the College of Science and Engineering and Moscow at Dean of the College. Before I begin though, I'd like to acknowledge uh, some special people in the audience. We have two former presidents of the University of Minnesota, both distinguished faculty members in the College of Science and Engineering. Ken. <laughs> Former President Craig Keller and Craig Taylor, and Dean Emeritus of the College of Science and Engineering, Steve Crouch. Steve. <laughs> These lectures have been an important way for the College of Science and Engineering to share the work of our faculty on solutions of major societal challenges. The cases and stories that are <clears throat> about research we have been able to share through the lectures have been compelling and very well received by the uh, attendees. CSE public lectures are also an opportunity to feature our distinguished alumni and the way the impact of their research and other work has been on, uh, on the society. And this evening is one such occasion which coincides, by the way, with a special year of celebration in our Department of Chemical Engineering and Material Science, Centennial Celebration of Chemical Engineering and the Jubilee Celebration for Material Science. The college takes great pride in the accomplishments of its alumni. Indeed, I believe our greatest impact on the society and the economy is through the work of our graduates. In turn, the education of our students and the scholarly work of the faculty are tremendously impacted by the generosity of our alumni and friends. I wish to express our gratitude for the contributions of many in the audience who have made possible for the college to reach its fund fundraising goal uh, under the university's driven campaign two years in advance of June 2021. Well, what that has meant is, of course, that the goal has been increased. So, <laughs> thank you. I now have the pleasure of inviting the, to the podium my colleague and the head of the Department of Chemical Engineering and Materials Science, Dan Frisby, for his remarks and to introduce our distinguished speaker, Dan. So as Dean Cave just said, I'm Dan Frisby, faculty member and head of Chemical Engineering and Materials Science here. And it is my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, tonight's speaker. Our distinguished speaker is one of our own, University of Minnesota alumnus, Dr. Lynn Orr. Dr. Orr completed his PhD in our department in chemical engineering here in 1976, working with the legendary Professor Skip Scriven our former colleague and Regents Professor. After graduation, he worked for a bit at the Shell Development Company and then joined the New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology where he worked in the Petroleum Recovery Research Center. In the mid-1980s, Dr. Orr moved to Stanford University as a faculty member in the Department of Petroleum Engineering, ultimately becoming chair of that department from 1991 to 94, and then dean of the School of Earth Sciences for eight years 1994 to 2002. Dr. Orr's research focuses on the flow and permeation of hydrocarbons in porous media underground, on improving oil recovery processes, and on geological CO2 storage. He is widely known for applying advanced mathematics to these problems, and he has been recognized with a number of awards, perhaps the most significant of which was his election to the National Academy of Engineering in year 2000. Dr. Orr has been an outstanding champion for energy research at Stanford and across the country, serving as the founding director for two very large energy research projects at Stanford. The first, called Global Climate and Energy uh, Project, he ran from 2002 to 2008. In 2009, he founded and directed the formation of the Stanford Precourt Energy Institute, which currently involves over 200 faculty at Stanford, focused on a broad spectrum of problems in energy production, conservation, and associated climate challenges. 
His scholarship and experience in energy issues ultimately led to his appointment in 2014 as Undersecretary for Science and Energy in the United States Department of Energy under President Barack Obama and Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz, a position he held until early, uh, early 2017. As Undersecretary of Energy, he served as the Principal Advisor on Energy and Science Initiatives and Clean Energy Technologies within the DOE and across the administration. Dr. Orr has a broad and deep perspective on energy issues, and we are absolutely delighted to have him with us here tonight, speaking on transforming energy systems to address climate change. Please help me welcome Dr. Lynn Orr. There we go. Can you hear me now? All right, I'm going to stay down here because it reduces the risk of me falling off the stage in the middle of the... the and I will say that it is truly a delight to be back here at, uh, uh, at the university. Uh, those years in the 1970s were a wonderful time for me as a, uh, as a graduate student. Um, lots of friends, of course, and friends in the department, uh, but uh, working with a uh, I think uh, Dan or, or Moss said the legendary Skip Screven, that's for sure. He was a wonderful mentor. Uh, a, he had high expectations of his graduate students. I think that's a fair statement. To, um, but by golly, he taught me how to, to do research and he taught me how to write a paper that would get published. Uh, and, and that turned out to be good, and I, I took some of that with me with my own students over the years. So it's a, a pleasure to be back to visit with friends and to talk about something that uh, has occupied me most of the time for maybe the last 20 years. And that is, how do we deal with the, the challenges that, uh, that we're going to have to face um, uh, because of, uh, of things like climate change? So I'd just like to start by saying that climate change is with us now. We have uh, incontrovertible evidence that it's that it's happening and we know enough about why it's happening to know that humans are really uh, responsible so um, now we've been been pushing greenhouse gases into the atmosphere for a while um, and uh, and so the momentum there's a big thermal mass in the ocean but the momentum for change is uh, is building, and so we have a lot that we have to do. Now, the headlines here make that point. I'm fully aware, of course, that headlines are not evidence. Um, if anybody wants to talk about the evidence, I, I have that presentation loaded up for the, for the, uh, uh, the question period. But I'm, for now, I'm going to assume that we need to um, we, we can make the assumption that, uh, that we know enough to say that we really need to start transforming the world's energy systems in a way that uh, makes them uh, work much better with the planetary systems that we take advantage of uh, and provide uh, essential services. So how can we do that? Well, energy, of course, it's not the only way we humans interact with the planetary systems, but it is a primary way that, uh, that uh, we, our activities uh, influence things at a planetary scale. One of them is to push greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, and those, of course, have lots of impacts that range from, uh, from, from warming the atmosphere and the oceans and the planet, from moving weather patterns around, uh, rainfall, from uh, uh, adjusting temperatures for habitat changes for ice in the Arctic, for sea level rise, and on and on and on. So, so we need to think about an energy system that, uh, that does a better job of balancing those things. Um, so, we want, so what do we want out of such a system? We want it to be clean. We want energy to be abundantly available. It's, it's woven through every aspect of modern life. Uh, and we want it to be uh, affordable. The ec economic part of it is... Uh, is part of the deal, and then it needs to be reliable and resilient as well. Um, those of us who live in California and have to uh, deal with the aftermath of the, uh, of the forest fires and so on have been reminded of late that uh, resilience is an important part of the, of the deal. Um, but the good news is that we can work on a bunch of the, these connected problems all at the same time if we make a cleaner energy system. 
Now, um, I'll just focus really on the, the, the climate and environmental system for a moment. Um, with uh, This picture is, is in Beijing. Uh, but you know what? I grew up in Houston, uh, and that was in the, in the 60s. And we had days like that, too. Um, and if you think about, I don't know, Pittsburgh and LA and, uh, and San Francisco, we had uh, uh, lots of those, too. Um, Clean Air Act passed in 1970, uh, and here we are almost 50 years later. We haven't solved every, uh, every air quality problem, but it's a heck of a lot better than it was because we started and, and stuck with it over time. So um, uh, in this country, air quality still can benefit from uh, working on the climate change area, and of course in, in uh, think places like in Asia in particular, there's a big driver there as well. Uh, so the, the fact that we work on the temperature increase um, can be uh, dealt with at the same time we, uh, we work on air quality. Now, uh, I'm sure you're all aware that, uh, that uh, we, uh, we uh, had an international agreement, the Paris Agreement, that was an attempt to, to start working on this. Um, the, the United States has decided to withdraw from that agreement, but nevertheless, uh, uh, it's a step in the right direction. Um, and, and there was some, as, uh, as we got past the, the global recession here in 2008, um, then uh, emissions of, uh, of CO2 or CO2 equivalents seem to be uh, leveling off, but they've started back up again now. Uh, and so we actually have a big, uh, a big challenge going forward. Um, and uh, and we, uh, we need to do it now, and we need to up our ambition to, to make this be a... Uh, uh, something we can uh, we can do, but even as we're worried about being able to deliver on this, we should take some satisfaction in what's been accomplished already. So here's this gray band is kind of the the business as usual band, depending on the assumptions about what we do in terms of emissions. If you if the if current policies are fully admitted uh, fully uh, implemented around the world, then you get this band. If you look at the pledges that are made in the uh, Paris Agreement, if those are all uh, filled, then you get this band. This is what we need to do in order to get down in the, in the maximum two degrees um, C uh, climate change. Now, you might say, well, gosh, uh, the temperature varied by a whole lot more than two degrees C here uh, in Minneapolis today. Um, so what's all the big deal? Well, the big deal is that the difference between an ice age and an interglacial period is kind of five to seven degrees uh, C. So, so uh, a, a two degree shift is actually significant. And you can see that even though the Paris Agreement was, a, was an important step forward, it doesn't get us all the way there. So we need to, we need to continue and up our ambition and uh, keep working on this. So. Um, for the students in the audience, this uh, only part of these will be on the quiz. You know, so, <laughs> so this is this is actually an attempt to portray what energy resources we might have available to uh, to turn into energy services. You know, if you think about the energy system, we take some primary energy resource. It could be the sun. Uh, uh, at 162,000 terawatts of uh, of power. Uh, uh, arrives at the top of the atmosphere of the Earth, we humans use about, uh, about uh, 15 terawatts uh, on average. So you can see that there's a huge excess of energy. In fact, a whole lot of it goes into war uh, warming the surface here, evaporating water, that's all the rainfall and so on. Uh, some is absorbed in the atmosphere and that makes the wind resource that we can then turn into, into services and we use well, this, these are a few years old now, so it's a little bigger than this, but the 0 0.06 terawatts of wind power. So, so we're, we're just starting to use that. The solar, we actually reflect to space about 5,000 terawatts. So there's, the, the message here is that there's no shortage of energy. It's all about how we convert that to, uh, to energy services that we can use. There's a big wind resource. You can see the nuclear resources of here. There's a lot of heat stored in the upper part of the, the, um, the Earth's um, uh, uh, crust. And then there are lots of the, the fossil resources as well. We've used mostly the fossil resources, but there's no shortage of other energy resources we can put to work. Now, you say, well, okay, how do we do that? Well. 
if you look back through history, the steam engine appeared. This, so these are, these are the efficiencies of, uh, of engines broadly construed. So the steam engine came along at about 1700. The first one was about half a percent efficient. But it was a magical device because it, you could build a fire and pump water out of the coal mine. That's the first use of it. it was a certain irony in that somewhere. But uh, in any case, uh, uh, then a whole bunch of engineers went to work working on engines of, of all sorts. So if you get up here to a um, uh, solid oxide fuel cell with a, a heat recovery uh, gas turbine at the end, you can get in, up into the 70% range. <clears throat> Now, it would be good to pick up the pace because this took about 300 years. Um, so, uh, but it does say, say that, the, that having a bunch of smart engineers figuring out how do we convert those, uh, those primary energy resources in a way that's also clean is exactly what we need to do. Um, and it's worth remembering here that um, as much fun as it is for all of us who work in universities to figure out some nifty, cool way to do this uh, on a lab bench, in order to really influence this big energy system, we have to get to scale. Um, so uh, there are now lots of examples of learning curves as, uh, as you um, uh, increase the, the sort of double, uh, doubling and doubling again the amount of uh, uh, the number of devices you've, uh, you've made. You know, people learn how to do it better and, the, and costs typically come down. Um, and there are lots of examples of that. Uh, but, but we do actually have to get to scale. So that's one of the challenges we need to do that. We're starting to get there on, uh, on solar and wind. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll say about, more about that in a moment. So, so here's my, my uh, plan for how we do this. Um, it's vague here and there, but, uh, uh, but I'll, I'll try to uh, put some uh, flesh on those bones in just a moment. First of all, we should pay attention to energy efficiency. Um, in the United States, we haven't done a very good job of this. Um, uh, well, I could say we, we have left ourselves a, a lot of room to do better. That's the politest way I can say it. Uh, uh, Europe has been better, Japan has been better. Um, but if we pay attention to that, there, uh, there's all that energy that you don't have to, to transform uh, makes all the other tasks easier. Um, it needs, we need clean, low-cost electricity. That underpins everything else. I'll try to make the case that we, we can see a way to get there. Uh, we need to electrify energy services. Um, I'll, I'll say more about this. Um, you can think about you know, heating and cooling, transportation are the big ones where there's a big opportunity space there. Uh, we're going to need to be able to move power around the electric grid uh, in different ways from the way we do it now. Um, and uh, I think we're going to need to have some, uh, some carbon capture and storage to, to mitigate the places where carbon still stays in the system. And then I'm going to argue for a robust and vigorous and well-stocked uh, energy R&D portfolio at, uh, at universities and in, and in industry as well. There's a real opportunity to do much better. So let's, let's just talk a little bit about some of these things. So this is a simple example, but it makes the point. If you remember, an in, any of you still have incandescent bulbs? No, of course not. Uh, I, I needn't have asked, but, uh, but in any case, if you looked at the, so that, uh, uh, so here's your coal-fired power plant. On a good day, it was maybe 35% efficient. The grid's maybe 90% uh, efficient. Um, and the bulb was uh, uh, a not very efficient uh, converter of, of uh, electrical energy into light. So the overall efficiency of that whole process was about 1%. If you, uh, we had complex fluorescence. LEDs now are, have gotten to scale, and they're, uh, they're much better. And if you replace that, that coal-fired power plant with a natural gas combined cycle plant with a 65% efficiency, then you've, you've multiplied the overall front-to-back efficiency by a lot. Uh, and now, of course, we can supply the, with wind and solar, we can supply clean electricity. Now, the, because it's not combustion, it doesn't, the efficiency argument works a little bit differently. But nevertheless, we can do much better this and, and, and much lower emissions. So, so we should do that everywhere we can. So buildings, buildings consume about three quarters of the electricity and about 40% of all the, 
the, um, the energy that's, um, that's used in the country, in the United States, uh, ends up in a building somewhere. So that says, well, okay, that's where to go look for the opportunity to build things. There's a big long list here, which I'm not gonna go through, uh, but the big elements are heating and cooling and lighting. Uh, and we can see ways to do much better on those. Uh, and uh, I don't know, at Stanford, we're, there is a campaign underway that's replacing all the fluorescent lights with, with LEDs, but there's a lot of lights. So, uh, so it, you do it over time. Um, and things like insulation in Minnesota, I'm sure they don't need to worry about insulation. I, uh, I know that houses here are insulated, but in California, maybe not so much. Um, and uh, the, the team at uh, and energy efficiency at the Department of Energy uh, in our last big quadrennial technology review estimated that, uh, that we could uh, achieve with, with things that are economic now about a 13% reduction in energy use for the country. So, you know, 1% of the energy use in this country is a big deal. So that, uh, there's a real big, big opportunity uh, here as well. And there's a, a list of the kinds of things that can contribute to that. Um, Energy systems are also important. We, um, we have the advantage of a, of a mild climate at Stanford and we have just replaced our old natural gas combined cycle uh, gas turbine, about a 50 megawatt uh, uh, generation system with a district heating system where we use big heat pumps um, powered by solar electricity generated out in the Central Valley to take heat out of buildings. All year round, we use the cooling loop to take heat out of some buildings. And all year round, we push heat back in in other places. The winter-summer mix is different. But the overlap between those two means that we don't buy fuel to make the, uh, uh, the energy that goes into the hot water loop. Now, it took some capital investment to do this because we had an old leaky, creaky steam loop uh, that had to be replaced. But the net result saves us about $400 million over 30 years. Um, it reduces water use, which is a big problem for us, by 18%. And it's almost a 70% reduction in CO2 emissions for the campus as a whole. So, um, so the fact that it pays for itself and saves all that money, um, and it has a rate of return that's better than some parts of our endowment. So it just made sense to do it. Although we did have to work to convince the trustees of that, I have, I have to tell you. So uh, a lot can be done there. If you look at just the, the um, US residential and commercial energy consumption, just the uh, standards that were put in place through 2011 uh, meant from uh, reduced the estimated future uh, growth by a quite dramatic amount and saved trillions of dollars for US uh, consumers. So these are, it makes sense to do this. So now the economists sometimes say, well, gosh, if there are $100 bills lying around on the floor, how come nobody picked them up? And I think that's actually a good question. It, that's a sociology question. That's a, a question of what, how do we make decisions and whether we pay attention. But it does say there's a big opportunity space here. Um, and. Uh, and China has figured out that this is in their interest to work on as well. And so they're, they're uh, working on this too. So let me say a word about clean electric power. So first of all, um, the, if you, and we actually have a transition that's largely been driven by the availability of low cost natural gas. Um, it's uh, coal has had, particularly the old, uh, uh, single cycle coal, uh, coal plants have had a hard time competing. And uh, if you just replace uh, an old coal fired plant with a, uh, a combined cycle gas turbine, there's, there's less carbon per kilowatt hour in the fuel and the power plants are much more efficient. So that gives you something like a 70% reduction in CO2 per kilowatt hour. So that's a step in the right direction, but it doesn't get us all the way there. Um, and um, but there's some new uh, uh, power plant designs that allow capture of that CO2 in a relatively ex inexpensive way uh, for future carbon capture and storage, provided that we take the leaks out of the methane system. Methane is a strong greenhouse gas compared to CO2. On the 100 years time scale, it's about 25 times as uh, potent as CO2. The concentrations in the atmosphere are a lot lower and methane survives in the atmosphere for about a decade where the CO2 survives for 
hundreds to thousands uh, uh, and tens of thousands of years for the hardest part to get out. So, so there is a real opportunity here. Um, eliminating methane leaks is largely a detection problem, and this is a place where sensor development, there's lots going on in universities about how to do this better uh, as well. So uh, once we, when you find the leaks, we know how to fix them. That, that part's not hard. So you say, well, okay, clean electricity, we're, uh, we're, we're convinced. Um, worldwide, this is uh, uh, capacity additions that were, um, uh, and you can see that coal is going down, uh, solar um, and wind are growing fast, and total renewables um, uh, have um, uh, met, uh, been much larger than any other capacity. Now, you have to be a little careful in comparing these because the capacity of a, of a solar cell is typically listed as if the sun is directly overhead at noon and uh, you know, it's sort of the maximum capacity. And they don't operate, wind turbines don't operate at full capacity all the time either. So you have to be a little careful as you compare these things. But nevertheless, there's a big investment going on. And the reason is partly, uh, I know this is not readable, but this is, a, this is meant, you just look at the flow upward to the right. This is the efficiency of uh, research solar cells. And you can see that some of them are in the 40% range, these are the most expensive ones, but there's a, a wide variety of materials that have been put to work and have much better efficiencies over a good bit less than 300 years. So this one, this has been a success story. Um, and if you look at the cost of utility scale photovoltaics, this is a, uh, I don't know, China, France, Germany, India, Italy, and so on, the United States is over here. And in all those markets, there have been deep reductions in uh, in uh, the installed cost of, um, of the solar power. So there's a, uh, a transition that's underway and a big time there. If you compare other kinds of things, land-based wind, distributed uh, photovoltaics, uh, utility scale photovoltaics, and battery costs and LEDs, LEDs are, are down about 95% in, in price over about an eight year period. Well, that's, that's a testimony of the effect of getting to scale. Uh, and you have manufacturers being able to do this in a way that, uh, that produces uh, uh, a, a stark, uh, stark increase in, uh, in deployment of this particular energy technology. So we need to do this kind of thing for a variety of them. Um, these are estimates. These are, are cost estimates based on, um, uh, on actual announced solar average auction prices uh, by the date of commissioning. And so you can see that, that the, both the solar and wind costs have, uh, have continued to come down. Um, in a world where you have electricity at two cents a kilowatt hour, you can afford another, another energy transformation. So it enables a lot of other things. And uh, we did some estimates at DOE that suggested that th those kinds of, uh, of uh, um, uh, costs are eminently feasible. People always ask about uh, nuclear power, um, and that's um, uh, there's a, there's uh, it's uh, nuclear power plants have had a hard time competing in the dispatch market now because they want to run flat out all the time. They have a big fixed cost. Uh, the fuel cost is small, but uh, they have a big fixed cost. And in a market where daytime prices are fluctuating up and down, depending on how much wind and solar there is, they've had a hard time competing. Um, the primary difficulty, uh, we still haven't solved the waste problem in this country, and the primary difficulty is still cost. There is a new uh, uh, reactor design that's in design certification now at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It's called a small modular reactor. These are about 50 megawatts in size instead of uh, 250 to 500 megawatt big nukes. They, um, it's passively cooled. It has a much simpler system. It's, uh, it's driven by thermal convection instead of pumps. So they're, in principle, they'll be buildable in a factory and shipped to the site, put them in a hole, and you don't refuel them. They take, you take them back to the factory when they're done. We'll see whether they can get to enough of a market to uh, to start marching down the 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 uh, scale issue. Um, I think it's clear that it's easier to do that when the unit cost is that of an LED. 
uh, versus the unit cost for um, a, uh, uh, a nuclear reactor, where th the cost per watt of these reactors the, for the first of a kind doesn't look much better than the big nukes, but, uh, but in principle, if they can manufacture at scale, will be uh, better. So the grid. So the grid was, our grid was designed um, as based on having a modest number of big power plants and radial distribution. Um, and the local balancing areas kind of grew up until they bumped into each other. Um, and so now we have uh, uh, seven uh, balancing authorities across the, the country. Uh, the, you know, Texas has one by itself, of course. Uh, and then um, the, uh, uh, the Western Regional Grid and so on, there's the Northeastern uh, uh, Grid as well. Those, but those need to change now because we're about to have a, uh, that old radial system is now going to be much more interconnected. There's much more distributed generation. There's much more intermittency, uh, power, varying power quality. So we need to ban uh, develop a grid that's, that's uh, flexible and resilient and full of sensors and, uh, and um, uh, with active controls on where the power goes. You know, in the, it hasn't been so long ago that the grid was managed by an operator uh, in, a, in a control room somewhere phoning up a power plant and telling them to ramp up that, that spinning gas turbine that was uh, uh, there operating as a spinning reserve. Uh, we're, we're past that now, and we need to continue to work on this. Uh, this is an example of a, of a complex system uh, where we have uh, lots of things going on and need to, to be able to manage this in a, in a much better way than, uh, than we can with just turning power plants on and off. And indeed, we need to think about these systems as systems of complex systems. We have the grid, we have transportation, we have pipelines, we have... Uh, water, we have uh, sewage, all those systems depend on each other. They can't be operated independently, they need each other, but they have totally different time scales for responding to something. The, the grid, electrons move more or less at the, uh, close to the speed of light, natural gas moves in a pipeline at about 30 miles an hour, um, and a barge on the Mississippi, somebody pointed out uh, during the day today, that is slower than slower than that. So, so we need to better think about these systems in ways that, uh, that are different from what we do now, but that creates a lot of opportunities. Uh, the intermittency is a deal. This is, uh, uh, these are based on the California grid. Um, and as, the, um, as we've installed much more solar and wind, uh, you can see that in the middle of the day, we actually uh, don't need a lot of the natural gas uh, generation, but in the early evening as this rolls off, we need to bring 13,000 megawatts uh, uh, online in, a, in a, a couple of order uh, of hour periods. So, so there's a big uh, challenge of doing this. People are, so energy storage is one possibility. People are talking about batteries, but it takes a lot of batteries to, to be able to do this. Pumped hydro is the most um, uh, efficient round trip efficiency. Uh, but for that, you have to have a site and you have to have a mountain. It's not going to work in Houston uh, and maybe not in Minnesota either. Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure about that. But, but in any case, there is lots of work going on. This is a fundamentally a material science problem that, uh, that is rich with the structure of materials, with catalysts, with, uh, with managing reactions in materials at uh, small scale. So huge opportunity. If we have very low cost renewable power, then, then hydrogen can be an ener energy storage medium as well. So there, there are lots of possibilities here. So let me say something about transportation. Um, there are lots of electric vehicles coming on the market here in, uh, in the mid 2020s. Um, and uh, so you're gonna see, right now they're kind of 1% of vehicle sales. Uh, worldwide, so that's that's small. Uh, but I can tell you from uh, from driving an electric vehicle, where where I just do not ever go to a gas station. It's great, you know. I just plug it in at home. We 
we make all the electric power that we need for the house uh, from solar cells, but of course I sell it to PG&E in the daytime and then buy it back at night to charge my car uh, and run the lights at the house. So, so it, um, uh, it really is a pleasure to drive and they are, uh, I tell you what, if you think acceleration is good, the electric cars are rockets. Uh, they are, they're fun to drive. Um, but of course, the getting, we need to get the cost down. This is partly battery costs. It's partly uh, just the business of manufacturing, designing, and getting them to scale. I think you're going to take, this is going to take off. Whether or not this plays with automated vehicles and, and uh, driving, I mean, this could totally transform the way the auto industry works. Um, you can imagine that if I can phone up, use my smartphone to summon a, uh, autonomous vehicle that comes, shows up in five minutes, takes me safely to where I want to go. Why do I need to put all that capital cost into a vehicle that sits in the garage 90% of the time? You know, this could, uh, in, the, in my office in Washington, the, none of the young folks had cars. They, they used Uber and Lyft or rented a car when they needed it, but otherwise uh, didn't bother. So I think there's big changes underway. And both Britain and uh, France have talked about uh, uh, prohibiting IC engines after 2040. Um, I think this will be a long transition, but but one that could very well go faster than uh, than we uh, it, than we might expect. But it does say that even though vehicle electrification is growing rap rapidly, it's from a small base. So we need to have uh, be a, as efficient as we can in uh, in the remaining. Uh, internal combustion engine vehicles as well. So we shouldn't abandon uh, that. It won't happen overnight. Um, let me say a word about carbon capture and storage. So if you look at those estimates that I showed for the Paris Agreement and how, uh, what the, the various curves might look like, embedded in those is a set of assumptions that are going to these big integrated assessment models that uh, attempt to, to look at learning curves and the deployment of energy technologies around the world. And, and they all include some, uh, some carbon capture and storage as a way to, to uh, make that transition more economic and, uh, and speedier. And it, so there are some, uh, there's in, assumptions about injection of CO2 into the subsurface um, embedded in those. Um, and if we don't work faster than we have been already, we might very well need to take CO2 out of the atmosphere. And that's a big problem because the concentration of CO2 is, is very low in the atmosphere. Uh, and so the driving force for any of the standard technologies for capture uh, is not very high. So it, that's a big challenging problem. So you think about, well, what would you like to have? You'd like to have a machine that uses solar power that capture CO2 out of the air, that makes long chain uh, molecules that we can use for, for other kinds of things. And it would also be nice if the machines would self-assemble. And you say, wait a second, we, we have those. They're called plants. Uh, that's exactly what they do. And you know, I'm, I'm being facetious, but, but at the same time, the, the, the uh, sort of biological systems of the planet move around 70, billion tons a year of carbon. So, so those are places where the, both the agricultural system and, uh, and the natural systems, uh, there's work we can do to try to, to take advantage of those and to augment them in some, some places. So, um, so on the, the idea of capturing some of the CO2 and putting it somewhere, uh, we actually have a lot of experience doing this in the enhanced oil recovery business. That's how I started my career. Um, uh, the, uh, most of that CO2 has been come from separating from natural gas where you, you can't sell natural gas that has CO2 in it. So they separate that out and most of that's been vented. But now the injection projects around the world, most of that is, that, that is being injected came from there. Um, but if, and if natural gas displaces coal in a big way, that helps, but we will have to do uh, carbon capture and storage for natural gas if it stays in the mix. Um, and we may need to deal with this removal from the atmosphere. So you say, well, okay, how would we do that? Um, and there are a variety of, of sources. 
Uh, we've mostly focused on the higher concentration sources. There's a variety of natural ways to capture it, of technically enhanced natural processes, or then even direct air, air capture. People are working on that, although the costs, again, look still too high. You can turn that, that CO2 into products. Um, unfortunately, if you're trying to make a fuel, it takes more energy to turn the CO2 into the fuel than you're going to get by, by burning it in the end. So we, uh, there's, a, there's a problem there. Um, and then the geologic side of storage, we have a fair amount of experience there, but we need to, need to do more. Now, if, for those of you who want a really big challenge, how about a, um, a presumably nanostructured catalyst device that uh, takes electricity and, uh, and reduces, uh, reduces CO2 to make a fuel? Um, and if you can, even if you can just give us CO and hydrogen, we'll, we'll fissure tropes that into a fuel. Uh, so that would be, now, there are people that can do this already. There are catalysts that will do it, but it's not nearly efficient enough, so there's a, a lot of remaining work to be done. And CO2 can be captured from a conventional power plant. I, uh, this is actually a, a one that, I, that there's a demo plant outside Houston that's doing this now. It basically uses high pressure CO2 as the working fluid in a system with an oxygen separation here. They burn a fuel with CO2. Um, I mean, to make CO2 in water, the fuel is likely methane. Then that goes through a CO2 turbine. Because CO2 is more dense than steam, the turbine can be much smaller, uh, and, uh, and it, uh, uh, then the CO2 is cooled to knock the water out and recompressed and re-injected, and the whole cycle goes on. Now, you have to take CO2 out of the system because you're burning a fuel, but that comes out at a high pressure that's where it can be actually injected into the subsurface. They claim efficiencies. Uh, near 60%, and they claim they can be competitive with a uh, combined cycle power plant. We'll, we'll, they'll have to deliver, but if so, this would be a way to be able to, to do all this. And I will just observe that if you start with a methane molecule and oxidize it to CO2, you take that methane molecule out of some rock in the subsurface, oxidize it, you can put it back to the same place in the subsurface and have volume left over because CO2's molar density is always higher than methane's molar density. So in principle, you can, can put that CO2 back into the rocks uh, where the carbon came from in the first place. Um, there are some complexities, I, which I'll skip over, of course. And let me finish by saying something about technology innovation. And I'll just use some examples from colleagues at Stanford just because I, I, I know about them and they're uh, and I just think this opportunity space is here, so huge that it's worth talking about. So the one I'll just mention is that, you know, there's a portion of the atmosphere where that's clear to radiated energy. And there's three degrees Kelvin sitting back up there. And those of, us who, of you who remember your, your radiative heat transfer, it goes as the fourth power of the, of the temperatures. So if you can take a material that's warm because all of us are warm on the surface and it radiates in the right uh, range, then it's looking at three degrees Kelvin. So it can transfer energy back to space even uh, in the middle of the daytime. Um, and so this, uh, this was actually predicted by some of the the theoreticians at Stanford and then they've, they've managed to make uh, uh, materials that do this. Now, the efficiency is not high enough yet, and the costs are not low enough yet. But nevertheless, it's a, an alternative to the to the vapor compression kind of air conditioning that we use around the world. Uh, and there's a startup company, of course, um, to uh, to commercialize this uh, this device as well. So lots of opportunities. If you if you look at the Department of Energy's Quadrennial Technology Review, there are many more examples of fun things to do. A vigorous research program, largely university-based, is exactly what we need here. And uh, this kind of restates my, my hope for drop-in fuels uh, made electrochemically uh, because that would allow us to use a, a, a large set of energy systems around the world that, that already exists. So, um, so plenty of uh, things to do there. Here's my uh, personal wish list. And, uh, and for all of you students in the audience, I, please get on with this. I'm getting old, you know, and I need, I, I need you to, to do this. Um, 
electrochemical reduction of CO2, uh, biofuels that store carbon uh, and add CS to, to generate negative uh, uh, emissions, more efficient water uh, purification. Water is going to continue to be a big place in the dry parts of the world, and climate change will mean that the dry places get drier and the wet places get wetter. So, so there's going to be a, a, an issue there. Better batteries for all the reasons made from earth abundant, low toxicity materials. Better sensors for methane. Uh, power electronics that uh, can help us manage this new grid that we're building. Active controls on power uh, flows, that's more power electronics, really. Low cost, low global warming potential, efficient air conditioning, and uh, cheap solar and wind to, to do all the other stuff. And, and oh, by the way, a price on carbon would be helpful as well. So, um, so let me conclude by saying that, um, you know, we should, even as we worry about the future, we should remember that we have made a lot of progress. Um, and in particular, the deployment of wind and solar uh, over the last few years is, is really uh, heartening, and there's a lot more we need to do. Um, we need to be more urgent about this. We need to boost our ambition. Uh, we need a portfolio. You want to be diversified across primary energy resources and ways to convert them into energy services. Uh, and we just need to get on with this uh, deployment at scale because that's how we'll control costs. So energy efficiency, clean electricity, diversify storage, electrify services, think about the systems, drive new technologies to scale, deploy CCS, and, uh, and do research. Simple, eh? <laughs> okay, so let me just close by saying, look, we can do this. Uh, it's a challenge, and I don't discount the magnitude of the challenge, but there's some ifs. We have to make up our minds. We're still making up our minds on this, and uh, so we aren't there yet. We need to increase our ambition now, and if we stick with it in a sustained, multi-decade uh, effort to, to develop the world's energy systems in a way that balances their interactions with the planetary systems that we count on for all kinds of services. If we do that, we can make this work. So let's get to work. Thank you very much. Uh, good question. So the question was, what about airplanes and are biofuels the solution? Now, I have to admit, first of all, that uh, I am guilty of some carbon sins uh, involving airplanes. I flew myself here from California yesterday in a small airplane, so, so I'm sensitive to this subject. Um, the biofuels might be one of the, there are already biofuels that are making their way into the, uh, into the air system. Um, I was just in Geneva uh, a week or so ago and, um, and uh, met with a group that uh, is uh, basically taking waste oils and so on and manufacturing uh, jet fuels from those. That's, there's not enough of that feedstock in order to do this in a big way. So, so plants are one avenue and, uh, and uh, I think uh, they're the ones that will get there first. Whether they'll end up being cost competitive, I don't know. It depends. This is why you do a portfolio, because you're not sure how that will play out. Airplanes are really a challenge, and the long-haul shipping is also as well. I think the electrification works well for urban transportation. Some of the big trucking companies are talking about hydrogen as a fuel for them, uh, but I, it's hard to see hydrogen fueling airplanes or or batteries or uh, any of those other things. A dense liquid hydrocarbon fuel looks pretty attractive, and bio is one way to get there. Are the metals used in solar panels and battery technology as well? 
sustainable enough to be that big a part of the solution, or do we need to refocus more on things like nuclear power? Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. Um, metals are uh, another place where high temperature heat is used to, to make them, except for aluminum, which is done electrochemically. Um, the, uh, a group, one of the groups I worked with at Stanford did a study a few years back that uh, asked, you know, it takes, it takes energy to make all those solar panels. Um, you know, how long do you have to run them and when do, they, when do they start making more power than we're taking to build new solar panels? Um, but if you look at the, at the energy consumption in the manufacturing, one of the ways that they've reduced the cost is to reduce the amounts of materials and so on. So yes, you, can, you make, there's a, there's a concept called an energy return on investment. And you ask how much energy it takes to make the, the device and then how much does energy does it provide over its lifetime? And those numbers have improved steadily for solar. So there's no question that you can, you can do that. But it also points out that, that uh, making, uh, uh, refining the metals and finding better ways to do that at, uh, that use less energy uh, or, for example, use um, hydrogen to make the high temperature uh, heat that you need. There's, a, there's an opportunity to do that as well. The industrial sector is one where we haven't made as much progress as in some of the other areas, and metals is, a, I think, a big opportunity space. The other big thing that we use in scale is cement. Um, and cement, uh, the way it's made now, you take calcium carbonate, and usually it's methane. You use something to heat it up, drive off um, uh, CO2, uh, so you get the CO2 that came from the calcium carbonate to make calcium oxide, and the, the CO2 that came from burning the methane. So it, it actually is a significant contributor to worldwide emissions, and we make a lot of it. So, um, so there's an opportunity to uh, either do some capture there or to, to there are cements that people are using, uh, are making now that have much lower CO2 content. So, so there's work to do there as well. It, it seems that the relatively low efficiency of generating hydrogen from electricity is often cited as a reason to not, not use it as a storage and transport medium, but it, it seems also that some of the intermittent sources of, of electricity have, you know, really low incremental, you know, spot costs, as it were. Does that kind of, can you comment on how that shifts the balance? You know, why wouldn't we be willing to use a low efficiency process when the energy is kind of approaching free? Yeah, yeah. No, it's a great question. Um, it comes back to this question of whether we, uh, if we have cheap, really cheap electricity, then uh, we make a lot of hydrogen every day. Most of the way it's made now is by steam methane reforming, um, but vast quantities are made in fertilizer manufacture and in refining operations now. Um, that, uh, I heard a presentation by uh, an oil company guy this, uh, about a week ago, and he claimed that if, if they had electricity at two cents a kilowatt hour, they could compete uh, and make money with, uh, with steam methane reforming. Now, that I think has to be based on having done it for a while. So you probably, and I, it's, uh, so I think they're, because I, we can see a pathway to get to low cost uh, uh, electricity, and we can think about the whole scale thing, it will take a while, but I, I think actually there is a, um, and then people are working on all kinds of ways to, to boost the efficiency of, uh, of hydrolysis and electrolysis of, of, uh, of water and other sources. So I, I think that's an area that's wide open for research. What is the future of nuclear energy? Yeah, so the new future of nuclear energy. This is usually where I say, for heaven's sakes, don't make any investment decisions based on anything I'm about to say. Uh, <laughs> and that goes for the rest of the talk, too, by the way. Um, so, uh, so I think the, 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 the situation is different depending on where you are in the world. Um, the the uh, Chinese uh, are building nuclear power plants at, at lower cost. The Koreans uh, 
uh, have lower cost manufacturing of nuclear plants than we do. Uh, it's not as clear that they have the same safety standards. Um, what's going to limit nuclear power in this country, I think, is cost um, and uncertainties about, uh, about waste storage. If the small modular reactor uh, idea uh, takes off, there are two customers for the first uh, plants out there. If that experience goes well and then there's a prospect for manufacturing, then, uh, then I think there's some hope. Uh, but it's going to be a challenge, especially in a world where you have very low cost other uh, sources of electricity. The appeal of having a baseload uh, uh, amount there is, uh, uh, is, I mean, obviously we need something that, to deal with the intermittency, but the nukes so far have not been great at ramping up and down. It is possible to design them in such a way that you could do that, but a lot is going to have to happen, and it's not clear there's a market driver for that to happen. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, electric vehicles are rather small percentage at the present time. With large-scale electrification of transportations, well, wouldn't that require major capital investment in the transmission grid? And wouldn't that be a very large cost in that transformation? It, it, it is certainly true that as we move, uh, you know, the, my, my overly simplistic prescription here was to electrify lots of energy services and of course what that over time that more or less doubles the demand for electricity. Um, we need to work on the grid anyway um, uh, to deal with um, all the resilience issues. So the additional investment to be able to do to deal with that is not as big as the investment it takes to, to uh, electrify the services, so the vehicles themselves. So yes, absolutely, it takes an investment. Uh, but the payoffs come from the fact that uh, there are much lower generation um, emissions. So re re replacing coal-fired power plants in this country has already led to uh, a substantial reduction. And so I think in the end, the, those, the I mean, one of the things that, that we did in the analysis that led to the clean power plan, for example, was to look at costs and benefits of doing um, of even that the modest set of steps. Um, and the, the energy payoffs are big and the health payoffs are big as well. So, so yes, but you don't do all of this all at once. You do it over time. And, uh, and we invest trillions already uh, in energy systems around the world. So. We just need to invest those wisely. Is any work done or any research being done on hydroelectricity energy generation? Yes, hydro is being uh, uh, deployed now. There are a bunch of systems that, uh, that you know, traditionally you built a great big dam um, and stored water behind it, and then that's dispatchable. And in California, at least, we pump a whole lot of water uphill at night with the wind uh, resource and then dispatch it during the daytime. The round trip efficiencies are approaching 90%, so they're really good. Um, if you had uh, uh, more hydro available, um, there, we, we should use it. There are a bunch of resources that, in, that are, can be done in sort of run of river settings without having to build a big dam. Um, so I think there's, there's resource there to be deployed. It's, it's probably not enough to do, to run the whole electricity system. It's one more element of, uh, of the uh, portfolio and it'll work in some places and, and not in others. So it should be uh, definitely in the mix. <laughs> Um, going forward. I see there's one back there, so we'll get that too. But uh, Lynn, um, we've got some, some young people in the audience, some students, and so if you could roll back the clock and, and uh, imagine yourself again as a young chemical engineer or, or materials engineer and you wanted to work on um, energy issues, where would you place your bets right now? Ooh. Man, that's a really hard question. But I would, I like the idea of rolling back the clock. I have a few body, <laughs> few body parts that could use some restoration uh, 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 that, uh, that knee issue. So uh, in any case, um, y you know, the reason that that question is so hard to answer is because I think the opportunity space has never been bigger. Uh, the, and, I, you know, we talked about a bunch of the ranges uh, 
uh, of things that you could do. Material science, in one way or another, every en energy con uh, conversion somehow involves materials. And sophisticated, we can make materials now that are structured in ways we couldn't even contemplate a few years ago. Uh, we can imbue them with properties. We can install catalysts. Uh, and then we can design systems that use these. Um, and it just seems like there's just this rich world of, uh, uh, of, of biology and chemistry and physics uh, and engineering that can help us do all these kind of things. So I, it would be hard to decide. But, uh, and so I don't know exactly what I would do. But I, I just would encourage students to look for the places where where you have um, have something of, in, of interest because, gosh, it will be uh, uh, hugely, there's just a lot to do. And we need all the players we can get on the field, so get with it. Uh. One last one, right, right back there. Um, so a lot of the discussions have been on technology, and we see um, perhaps some encouraging signs um, in that realm. But as this sl last slide shows, uh, the other big problem is how do we collectively, you know, muster up the will to do it? I mean, you said, you know, make up our minds, continue on this path, ambition, sustained effort. So can you say something about how do we do that? So it's a really good question, of course. Um, I chose to talk about the technical problems because as challenging as they are, they're easier than, uh, than the ones you just listed. Um, and so I think 